people, you know, somebody's in, in the somebody's going to be in the room from uh, Monday through Thursday. So you know, you'll be able to meet somebody regardless of which day is free. Oh, nice. Yeah. What are you talking about? Uh, the computer science club. What's the computer science club? It's a club for computer science students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, when's the computer science? Oh, when? Club? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know the exact time yet, you know, but on Tuesday at noon, that's for sure is one of the meeting times. Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon time, and the place is room one fifty two, section D and E, you know, the, the whole area behind the glass windows. You guys are going to do this time? Sorry? Do you guys know what you're going to do this time? Um, well, I leave it up to the, you know, the club, you know, or the, you know, the club members to decide what they want to do. I'm just oh, okay. the advisor. So typically what they do with the student club is um, we will have invited, you know, speakers, um, you know, maybe some professors, somebody from industry, and then we'll have some focus on certain topics. Um, Gaming, uh, game computing or gaming, you know, game programming is one of the focus from last semester. Um, we also talked about security stuff, like you know how hacking occurs and simple hacking techniques and stuff like that. Uh, so it all depends on you know who is in the club and you know what they want to do. Oh yeah, because you guys got on real less. Right, exactly. But it all depends on who's president and what that person would likes to do and you know right. the the rest uh, of the club as well. So I just want to show you guys, you know, uh, this particular website, you know, it's norscorp.com. <clears throat> and it ba it's basically showing you in real time, live, you know, all the attacks, um, you know, cyber attacks. So this is live and you can see the United States, you know, uh, Seattle, San Francisco or slash Bay Area. And then the East Coast, probably Washington DC, you know, I'm guessing are the uh, usual landing places for the attacks. And you can also see you know, which country origins, uh, originates most of the attacks. Because you know, the, uh, the animation actually shows you, the, uh, you know, who is attacking who, and who is being attacked. So it's, a, it, it's an interesting website. You know, I just wanted to kind of bring this up. Because what we learned in this class does not seem to have anything to do with computer security, but in a way it does. Okay, because you know, security holes or vulnerabilities happen usually, not <laughs> only, but usually has to do with a part has to do with you know basically faulty programming uh, and or programs that are not well tested or uh, or verified um, before it's released. Okay, I think this program can handle TCP/IP according to the specification. Yes, but can it handle you know packets that are intentionally broken? to get into the system. Oh, I didn't test that. <laughs> right? So it is important to state you know, what the program is supposed to do and say, okay, this is the kind of stuff that we do not let through. Okay? That's the important part from the security standpoint. So if you if if, if you really kind of think about it, you know, this kind of stuff you know happens and most of it is possible only because you know we do not have automated program verification. Because if we did Okay, and you and you read and program in or not program in, but you specify the TCP/IP standard, you know, in the full specification, including excluding everything that is not following the the standard. Then a lot of the attacks you know could not happen. Your programs would be would be more secure. So, just kind of a little bit of stuff that is related to this class, you know, and. Um, We'll just kind of, I'll close this window and we'll go back to our homework assignment. The first one is the Math Jacks homework assignment. And I want you guys to enter this particular equation. So the key to do this is to figure out, you know, the LaTeX, L-A-T-E-X, or L-A tau epsilon chi um, commands to do it. Well, but there was a hand. Yep, go ahead. I couldn't find where that was. Where is that? Like where is that assignment located though? Like it's on the top. This is a under course introduction. It's the top uh, topic. Oh, I was thinking it was under SAS. Um, nope. Okay. okay, so the, the way to do this, um, I can just write it on my uh, document camera because I know the commands to do it. 
I know this stuff fairly well because I use it a lot um, when I write the equations and my own notes. So, yep, go ahead. Where do you post your videos? Where? Yeah. It's uh, at YouTube. So um, I'm just going to write it on the board because otherwise it becomes a kind of circular equation, right? So you just go to youtube.com slash S O M E P R O F S, no sum props. That's the uh, URL. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So getting back to the LaTeX command to do the homework assignment. So I'm gonna oops, adjust it a little bit, right about there, and refocus. There we go. And I have a pen right here. All right. So I'm going to do this using a part of the screen displaying the equation itself or the form or the expression, and then use the uh, uh, my um, document camera to actually provide the code. The for all is a backslash, just for all. Okay, that's the for all part, and then x is just x. You know, there's nothing special about x. The exist symbol, the the e, is um, exists. And then you have um, the, the funny looking Z. That's actually math BB. And then in oh in the curly braces, you type a regular Z. Okay, the rest are fairly easy. The only one that is um, the not equal symbol is done by a backslash NE for not equal. And then the V symbol is a backslash, I think it's just V, V E E. Um, and then the left right arrow is backslash uppercase left um, I cannot remember hmm? yeah but is it uppercase right or just lowercase okay. arrow there we go okay so if you but if you read the instruction of the uh, of this assignment it says You can also use the built-in HTML editor to do this. So I'll, I'll show you guys how to use the built-in editor. How many people did this, you know, using the built-in editor? Because it's that's just the easiest way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Didn't have the Z though. No, no. The the Z is intentionally put there so that you have to kind of read ahead of me a little bit. Then you can back, you know, you can do a, a right click on my notes and find out you know, how the funny Z is done. Because by the time you do this homework assignment, we, we, have, we had already talked about um, <clears throat> set theory. So when you look at basic set theory, the Z actually is one in this note here. Uh, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, when I talked about you know, um, a set that has an infinite number of elements. Oh, where is it? Yeah, it's further back. Sorry? I think it's further up. Further up? Right there, so so there we have it, right? So you just right click it and then say show math as, and then if you use tech command, that will show you exactly how to do that. So if you look at the command here, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yep, there you go. So that actually t t tells you that you can use the backslash in, not exists, I, you know, I misspoke. Um, but math BB, you know, in curly braces Z is how you make that funny Z symbol. So it's kind of like a sca scavenger hunt, you know, you kind of have to use, you know, resources available to you to figure out how to do it. Okay. Are there questions about this homework assignment? Okay. How many people think, yep, I got it done? Okay, excellent. All right. Oh, and the other thing you might notice is because it uses curly braces internal to LaTeX, to enclose things. So if you really need a curly brace in the representation, in what, whatever you're typing, you have to use a backslash to escape it. 
<laughs> so this backslash open curly brace is this actual open curly brace here. And the same thing goes for the closed curly brace. It is backslash closed curly brace. Because you know, curly braces by themselves have special meaning in LaTeX. All right. Any questions? Any questions about this? Um, <clears throat> If there are no questions about this, we'll talk about the other homework assignment because they, they, you had two homework assignments. And the other one is basic set theory assessment. And I think it's also due today. Oh, it's due on Monday. But Monday, there's no school. So I'll give you guys until next Wednesday to get it done. I thought the other one was due today. Hmm? The other self-assessment. The uh, self-assessment? The um, basic set theory, um, the first one. The first one? The yeah. self-assessment? Yeah. Does anyone, does anyone want me to go over the self-assessment? No? It's good? Okay. All right. So we are now going back to talk about functions. I will adjust the due date of this one. But let's go back and talk about um, functions and relations. So last time we talked about um, first order logic or predicate logic. And I introduced the symbols of there exist for all, that sort of thing. But we did not really quite have a chance to talk about how to apply that. So we'll go ahead and talk about that today. All right. So now we want to look at you know, the definition of function again, but this time making use of, um, the, making use of the quantifiers. Okay? There exist and for all are called quantifiers because they quantify how many things are we talking about. Are we talking about every single thing or are we only talking about, oh, at there's at least one thing that can do this. Okay, so that's the difference between for all and there exist. Okay. All right, so what we're doing, what I'm doing right now is to focus on this part. Okay, we want to kind of redefine the qualification of what makes a function a function but this time making use of those new operators that we have talked about. The for all symbol and then the there exist symbol, okay? All right, so what we want to do is to question. The question is whether f is a function, okay? Um, and we already know that the domain of the proposed function is the set x and the proposed, the codomain co of the proposed function is uppercase y. X and Y are, you know, basically two different sets, and so is F, okay? F is a set as well. It is a set of two tuples. Um, so we want to figure out, okay, but does F qualify as a function? Because just because F is a set of two tuples does not mean that it is a function that has X as a domain and Y as a codomain. So the first thing we want to do is to make sure that this is true. In other words, if x is the domain and y is the codomain, then f has to be a subset, not necessarily a proper subset, but a subset of the Cartesian product of x and y. Okay? Is that okay? Does everybody understand why that is important? Is that okay? Okay, I'm not... I'll just be safe, okay, because this will only take uh, a few minutes, but I just want to be safe and give you an example where a function, where a set of two tuple is not a function, okay? Even though it looks like it, it's not, okay? So what I'll do is I am defining f, proposing f as a function that has a domain of x, okay, I'm not going to use x here, I'll just spell out here you know, the domain here. So the domain is 1, 2, and then the codomain is a, b, okay? Just make it really simple. But all this is really stating is um, the input to the function has to come from one or two, and then the output of the function can only be a or b. So if later on I say, oh, look at this, okay? f as a function is a set of two tuples. The first one is okay. One a, no problem, because one comes from x or the domain, and a comes from the codomain, we don't have a problem. But this is not going to be okay. This is z. That is on the, that's not okay because z is not an element of the codomain. And as a result, f defined this way is not a function. 
because when you look at this particular set, it is no longer a subset of a, a 1, 2 Cartesian product AB. And that's why F is not a function. Is that okay? So I just want to throw an example to show you know, how a set of two tuples cannot be a function. Okay? All right. So if, are there any questions about this example of why F is not a function? Okay? So it failed to meet the first requirement. But the second requirement is something that we talked about already. It is a little bit obscure. It looks kind of funky. Um, let's read it from the beginning. The first part here is basically saying, let, let's consider everything, okay? So when we say everything, it includes numbers, it includes um, cars, it includes everything. It includes you and me and everything that exists in the universe. That's what for all x means, okay? For everything. <clears throat> so what we need to do is to say, oh, hold on a second here. If it's a Miata, we don't really care because it, it, it does not apply to this type of qualification. And that's why we have this part here. Not x is in x, or not x in the domain is here, just so that, hey, if x is not even part of the domain that we are talking about, this statement is automatically true. Don't even bother to read the second part of it. Because what we want is to have an expression that is universally true for everything, okay? But if, if what we're considering is not even a part of the domain that we are talking about, hey, forget it. We don't need to know that. Is that okay? It's a, it's a filter, okay? So this part here, the part that I, I, I have highlighted, is a filter to basically say, okay, this is automatically true if it is not of interest to us. But what if x is actually an element of the domain? In other words, what if this part is true, which means this entire part is false? Well, since this is a disjunction, now we really have to look at the second part. So the second part is here, which is basically saying, since x is already bound, okay, by this time we already know which x we are talking about. We already know that x is an element of the domain, okay? So for that specific x, this is a set of two tuples, and each two tuple is an element of f, okay? So we're trying to find all the two tuples in F that has x, lowercase x, as the first item. But a set of that kind, we don't really care about the set itself so much. We only care about the cardinality. In other words, how many elements do we have? And it has to be exactly one. It cannot be zero. It cannot be two. It has to be exactly one. Is that okay? Or not? Okay. What it really literally is saying, it's simply saying everything in the domain has to map to something in the codomain exactly once. That's all. All right. So I kind of explained that you know verbally you know, down here, <clears throat> and this part explains it, what the first part is. You know, it's basically just a filter. So the shorthand to do this, sometimes I would use this notation. I would basically just say for all x in the domain, consider the following. In other words, it's just shorthand so that I don't have to say, oh, forget everything that is not a part of the, of the domain. I'm just saying that, okay, let's only consider x when it is a part of the domain. The rest has to be true in that case. So it's a really just a shorthand, but it kind of makes sense. So are there any questions about first order logic or the stuff that is on this slide? This is the first taste of uh, first order logic. It's not the only. We will definitely come back and revisit first order logic later on, but in a different context. Um, okay, go ahead. What does it mean that you have to list that tuple twice, the x, y tuple? Uh -huh. what, what does it mean that you list it twice right now? Oh, okay. So the way you read um, the specification of a set like this, this part here is saying you know everything inside the set has a format of a two tuple, and not only that, the first item of the two tuple has to be x, which is bound over here. So we already know that that x is an element of 
the domain. And then the bar, the vertical bar here has a different meaning compared to the two bars outside. It's basically, it's saying such that. So every element in this set starts with lowercase x you know, in the tuple, but y can be whatever, okay? But that tuple has to be an F element of f, which is a set of two tuples. Is that okay? That was another hand, another question. Yeah, go ahead. I think mine was similar, because I, I was just trying to figure out. So it's like for for any given x, y tuple, that x, y is an element as a function. Okay, so let me see if I can write this in a more um, natural language friendly way. So we'll go to accessories, go to mouse pad, and see if I can write this in a slightly more you know, friendly way. So I'll bump up the font size first because right now it's um, really too small. Oh, no space, but we can bump it up to 14, 16, 17. I think that should be good. Okay, let me know if this is not big enough because I can certainly bump it up some more. Okay, so what this whole thing is saying is something like this, okay? Okay, for every element, lowercase x in the domain, which is uppercase x, the following, oops, doesn't wrap around, the following must be true, okay? Okay, so just this statement itself is already kind of important, because you know the, the every part, I think every you, know, you guys know what the every part means already. But what is important is after the statement, we already know that lowercase x is an element of the domain. Okay, we're considering a particular element x in the domain for the following. But that has to be true for every single element in the domain. Okay, so what has to be true? Okay, so I would say the cardinality of and I'm going to use um, programming indentation notation here because we have some nesting. So I will say the cardinality of the set such um, where every element is a two tuple <coughs> where the first item is x. So this x here, this lowercase x, is, is basically the same thing as this x over here. Okay, so that finishes um, you know, the description of the set itself, where every element is a two tuple, where the first item is x, and the two tuple is an element of f. Okay, so that finishes the description of the set itself. So if you want to say, you know, end set here, because it ends the description of the set. So we are getting back to the, cardinal, the cardinality part here. Okay, the cardinality of this particular set has to be exactly one. Okay, I'm not really sure. This is the first time I try something like this. So I look at this and go like, mm, I'm not really sure whether this is helping or hurting. <laughs> what do you, what do you think? Is this is it helping a little bit? Okay. All right. So you know, I, I'm just trying out new things. You know, as we go. You know, so if this is helping, you know, I remember this, and next time I'll try to incorporate it into my notes. Okay. Question. Did you also write something like for x x comma y double for all x comma y yeah, uh, w comma z in F, if W is equal to X, then then uh, Y is equal to Z. So basically, if the <coughs> function takes the same thing to the same thing, like if A is equal to B, F of B, A is equal to F of B. Um, I, I think I got kind of get your idea, but I cannot form a mental picture of the actual expression. So can you send it to me so I can actually look at it? Because, you know, I... When it comes to expressions, I'm more visual. I cannot see the nesting if I don't see it. Okay. All right. 
So this is you know, a, a quick introduction to first order logic. And first order logic is really just saying, okay, let's add quantifiers to all the other stuff that we have been doing. So now we're going to talk about injective function, surjective function, and bijective function. Um, these words, inject, injective, surjective, and bijective, they are adjectives to describe functions. In other words, from here on, we are already assuming that we are talking about functions. Okay? But there are certain properties of functions. One particular property is, is this function injective? Another one is surjective. Is this you know, function surjective? Bijective is easy. Because if a function is both injective and surjective, then it is automatically bijective. Okay? So the difficult part is, you know, okay, what is injective? So an injective function maps elements of the domain to unique elements in the co-domain. In other words, no two elements in the domain will map to the same element in the co-domain. Is that okay? So it has to be unique. All right, so let's go ahead and take some, uh, look at some examples of injective functions. And then we'll also, you know, I will change the question around and ask, okay, but is this surjective, excuse me, is this injective or not? So we'll go ahead and look at some actual examples. I think it's faster for me to type it here. Okay, so we'll look at um, f as a function. And these are all fu functions already, so don't worry about, okay, I'm not gonna give you something that is not a function, okay? So I will say this is mapping a, b, c to um, one, two. Okay, so if I give you something like this, you automatically know that it cannot be injective. Even if I, even I, I'm not telling you exactly how A, B, C are mapped to one, two, I know this cannot be injective already. Why not? Because there isn't enough in the codomain to uh, map right? the domain. And we talked about a, a, a certain principle that is actually useful here. Pigeonhole. Exactly, the pigeonhole principle. Okay? So the pigeonhole principle can actually be used in this case to basically say, oh, we can conclude right away that F cannot be injective. Is that making any sense? Okay, all right. So I'll just say here, cannot be injective because of the pigeonhole principle, where you cannot, um, one element in the codomain is going to have more than one element in the domain mapping to it because there are not enough in the codomain. Okay, so let's look at this one here. So here's F, this is A, B, C again, and the codomain is 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so with this one, can you tell whether it's going to be injective or not? You cannot know right right away, right? Because just because the codomain is bigger or has more elements than the domain, cannot be cannot confirm one way or another. Because you can leave certain elements in the codomain not used. It's perfectly okay not to use some of the elements. So with this one, I actually have to tell you what is f. Okay, what are the elements of f? Okay, so I can say a maps to four, no for no particular reason. Um, B maps to 2 and C maps to 3, okay? So in this case, you know, F is injective because when you look at all the elements of the domain, each one maps to a different element in the codomain. Yes? That would also make it a proper subset. It is a proper subset, correct. The only time when it is not going to be a proper subset is when your domain and your codomain only has one element. Because in that case, the mapping has to be from here to here. But for any other cases, okay, think about this. Oh, okay. Think about this, okay? No matter how I define this F here, what is the cardinality of F? Given the domain itself has a cardinality of three, what do you think is the cardinality of F? Okay. Uh, no. But whether it's injective or not has nothing to do with that. The cardinality of the domain has to be the same as the cardinality of the function. 
because every element in the domain has to map to something in the codomain, but there's only one mapping. So that's why the cardinality or the number of elements in the domain has to be the same as the number of elements in the codomain, excuse me, in the function. Does that make any sense? Now, what is the what is the Cartesian product of A, B, C on one side and one, two, three, four on the other side? What is the cardinality or the number of elements of the Cartesian product, which is a cross product? It's going to be three times four. So we have 12 elements in the Cartesian product, but only three in the function itself. So it has to be a proper function. I mean, a proper subset, because the number of elements of the function is less than the number of elements in the Cartesian product. <coughs> Does that make any sense? But not. OK, so I'm just going to write it here. OK, is a, is a subset of ABC. Cartesian product with one, two, three, four, right? Because the Cartesian, the Cartesian product has 12 elements. Are we okay or not? Okay, all right. Okay, so in order to express injectiveness using our quantifiers and stuff like that, we need to get two elements from the domain. We can do something like this, okay? So what I'm doing here at the beginning, I'm just gonna highlight the part that is of importance here. I'm just saying that, oh, let's pick x1, x subscript one from the domain, and let's pick x2 you know, from the same domain, okay? And at this point, I'm not even sure how x1 and x2 relate. They can be the same, they can be different, okay? I'm just saying, okay, for all x1 in x, for all x2 in x, let's consider the following, okay? And the first thing I do in the following, okay, is to say, oh, you know what? If they are exactly the same, don't bother with the rest because I'm not interested. It's only when they are not the same, when they're different, then I want to say something about x1 and x2. Because the whole thing about injectiveness has to do with unique codomain elements in the mapping. So if, the, if x1 and x2 turns out to be the same, you know what, I, I don't have anything to say because you know, it has nothing to do with injectiveness. But when x1 and x2 are different, then I, I have something to say. There's a, there's a qualification that I need, okay? So the whole thing is this part here, okay? So the first part we already ex explained. It, this all the way up to the or is basically saying uh, for all x in x, for x for all x1 and all x2 in x, if they are different, then we want to consider the second part. Okay, so now we can focus on the second part and say, okay, but what is that really saying? <clears throat> and you notice that uh, these are and operators, so there, this is a whole bunch of conjunction. Okay, so the first thing we need to know, or what we need to confirm is, okay, let's say that x1, y1 is an element of f. In other words, at this point, I'm binding um, y1. Okay, x1 was bound because of the for all x1 in x. But y1 is now bound because it relates to x1, because, it, because x1 maps to y1 in this function. And then the second part is binding y2, because we already bound x2 in the for all x2 in x, so at this point I'm binding x2 so that we can say, okay, we know what x2 is, but what is the mapping of x2 in the codomain? Oh, it's y2. So in other words, this part here is really just expressing x1 maps to y1, x2 maps to y2, and at this point we already know x1 and y, x1 and x2 are different. So the last part here is saying, okay, they cannot map to the same thing. Because x because y1 and y2 cannot be the same. Are they are we doing okay so far? with this notation. Now you don't have to answer this question or raise your hand, okay? I'm just gonna ask it. Um, how many people, you know, even though I'm asking, you just have to answer your own question, you don't need to raise your hand. How many people are feeling slightly comfortable with this notation and how many people are thinking, oh man, this is really still obscure, 
okay? This is not how I would write something and not how I would express the same logic. You don't have to raise your hand um, because I'm just going to tell you a story. <laughs> when I wrote my dissertation, my entire dissertation originally looked like that, okay? It's just a whole bunch of for all, there exists, you know, mathematical symbols, derivations, and stuff like that, which I felt was really good because I think I, I was I was thinking, I was doing the proof you know, step by step, and I was not skipping anything. I did not say obviously this is the conclusion, or obviously this is true. Okay, you guys remember that story about obviously true, right? Where's the obviously symbol? Huh? So where's the obviously symbol? I would imagine it's an O. <laughs> it's obviously an O. <laughs> obviously an O. So it's O with an O inside, I guess. <laughs> so, so I was feeling pretty good because I was actually proving the theorem step by step, you know, using mathematical symbols where there's no ch no chance of ambiguation. Okay, unless it's my mistake, there's no no way that. Someone can read it and have two ways of interpreting what it means, okay, which is the best thing about mathematical notations. So I turned in to my advisor and also my uh, dissertation committee, and the first feedback that I got was, Tech, you have to use English. <laughs> <laughs> then I go like, but, you know, but this is expressing exactly what I want to express. I'm expressing the proof step by step using mathematical symbols. They go like, no, 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 you have to use English. Then I ask, so where do I put all the mathematical proof stuff? Into the appendix. But that's like 95% of what I have done so far. <laughs> so in the end, what I actually ended up doing was, you know, I had to fluff it up a little bit. So I had to include like pictures, you know, actual descriptions in English and stuff like that. But the appendix was still pretty long because you know, all the actual proof was actually in the appendix. I had to move it into the appendix. So I had to fluff up the uh, dissertation from about 50 something pages, which is actually really, really, really short for a dissertation, to about 80 or 90 pages. I have a copy in my office. I haven't really counted since I graduated. <laughs> but that's, but I, I tell you that story just to, so that you feel you know, better if you think, oh, this is all really foreign to me. It's okay, okay? Even my professors, you know, my, uh, the, my um, dissertation committee, you know, thought the same way. So you're not alone. Yep. That's a good question. The uppercase X represents the set, right? Yes, the uppercase X is our domain, the domain of the, of the function in question. So the very definition of the set is each element. Say again. The, the definition of the set, each element needs to be a That's correct. Well, let, let's take a look at you know what can fail this particular qualification. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out because I need to look at the entire thing, and then what I'll do is to give you an example, and I'm going to use um, the uh, text editor because it's just a, a whole lot easier for me to type, and in this case, I don't need a whole lot of mathematical symbols. Yep, go ahead. Oh, sure. No, the text editor. Yeah, I have to move this first, then oh. I move this. <laughs> Need to make room. Yeah, this is one of the things that will be fixed in the replacement building. You know, some of you might have heard that the entire liberal arts area is going to be torn down. Hmm. Within a year or so, okay, all of these buildings will be torn down. These are all built in the 50s, and they're they're surprisingly rugged. You know, but they're, they're going to be torn down, and instead, you know, using a much smaller footprint. There will be a three-story building that will be housing all the same classrooms, so computer science, business, uh, mathematics will all be in that new building, but um, engineering, astronomy, and physics will be moving in with us as well. So some people, some people call that the STEM building. Yep. So where are, they, where are the classes going to be built? Will that be built? Um, we'll all be moving to the portable village, except there's not enough space right now in the portable village. So I think the portable, portable village will expand as a result, but we are all going to move into those you know, temporary buildings for at least two years because the move-in date of the new building is 2019, about fall, and so that's the current projection. But we are going to tear down these buildings within a year. Hmm. There was another question. 
Let's say that again. There. Okay, I, I mentioned that because you know I specifically ask that the projection screen be placed so that it is high enough that I don't have to, so that the bottom part will still be usable. Because right now the bottom part is not usable for people in the back of the classroom. You know, you know, the other students in front of you will be blocking the lower portion. Okay, so examples. Okay, so we want to fail this thing here. In particularly, we want to fail this part. So let's go ahead and make. Um, well, I'm just going to reuse this example because it's just so much easier to copy and paste. And all I have to do is to change that to B two, B maps to two, and C maps to two. Okay. So how is this failing that you know the um, the expression on top here? So when I say for all x1 in x, okay, um, in one particular case, x1 can bind to b, okay, and then the x2 can bind to c. Is that okay? b equals dc is false. That forces me to look at the other part of the evaluation of the expression. So the other part says, you know, okay, let's bind y1 based on x1 because x1 is b so that will bind y1 to be 2 and i also want to use x2 to bind y2 x2 is already bound to c so that will automatically bind y2 to 2 is that okay so up to up to this point here we have bound x1 y1 x2 and y2 but both x excuse me both y1 and y2 are two, so that's why you know y one different from y two is going to fail. This is going to be false, and because this entire thing is one big conjunction, when one expression of the conjunction is false, then the entire thing is false. So that's why in this particular example, it will fail, or it will uh, this expression will evaluate to false. So is that answering your question about the uniqueness? Because we are not really saying whether the elements of the domain are unique or not. We are asking, do they map to unique elements in a code domain? So it relies on the function f itself to do the mapping. Is that okay? Question? No, 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 okay. All right. So if this is okay, you know, we can always come back and revisit, okay? If you have any questions, you know, later on, we can always come back and revisit this. So the next slide talks about surjective function, and it starts with a um, verbal description first. A surjective function has each element of the codomain corresponding to an element of the domain. In other words, we are using all the elements in the codomain in this case. Being surjective does not imply injective. This means that a function like the following is surjective, but it is, it is not injective. So we'll take a look at this particular function here. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll up here. So the function f has a domain of one, two, three, four, has a codomain of x, y, z. But the actual mapping is mapping one to x, two to x, three to y, and four to z. It is surjective because when you look at the elements in the codomain x, y, z, they are all utilized in the mapping. And that makes it surjective. But it is not injective because 1 and 2 from the domain maps to the same element x in the codomain. Can you show that definition again? Sean? Sure. So the question is, are you using all the elements in the codomain? That's really the question. If you are using all the elements in the codomain, then it is surjective. If you're not, then it is not surjective. Is that okay? So then the next question is, how do you express it using quantifiers and other types of uh, mechanisms as an expression? Now the answer is already spelled out here, so what I'll do, unless you have a photographic memory, <laughs> now you don't see it. So let's see how we can derive the mathematical expression to say kind of exactly the same thing. I want to be able to say that all elements in the codomain are used. Okay? So how would you go about doing this? So that there's no... I like that. I like that starting point. Go ahead. There's no... Um 
x and y that are not in the function. Okay, so I, I think you're, you're getting the, the, the right starting idea in the right direction. There's nothing in the codomain that is not uh, for all uh, y in, in a codomain, and uh -huh. uh, there exists x, x uh, comma y in f. There okay. is x such that that uh, x comma y is in f. Okay, that works too. And, or you can use cardinality, right? You can make a set that that has the uh, codomain part already bound, and then you look at the cardinality of that set, you know, and that has to be a subset of f, and say you know it has to be one or more. Okay, so there are several ways to express it. There exists works too. Okay. So I'm going to spell it out you know, um, in these terms. Well, let's see. Uh, I, I'm just thinking whether to do it using the text editor or using the uh, uh, document camera, because the document camera does allow me to write mathematical symbols, whereas the other one does not. So I'm going to use the document camera for this purpose, because I do want to use um, the quantifiers. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to say, this time we are saying for all y, in the codomain, okay? In other words, the focus is no longer with the elements of the domain, but rather with the, the elements of the codomain, because you know, we want to make sure all the elements of the codomain are utilized by the function. Okay, so I'm gonna use uh, this notation to say, okay, let's focus on lowercase y, it is already known to be a element, an element of the codomain. So what do we want as a requirement of this y? Okay, so as you know, as he said, you know, we can use the there exist. Okay, so you know, that's actually the easiest way to express it. So we can say there exist an x, lowercase x, which is an element of the domain. Okay, so at this point we have bound a y so that it is um, an element of y, the codomain. We have bound an element that is. We have found x, which is an element of x of the domain. Okay, so the first thing we say, oh, um, what if x and y are not related by the function? Well, in that case, we don't care. Okay, so we basically say, um, okay, so we basically say. Um, there are several ways to say this. I'm going to use an alternative way to say this because we have been using functions, but without using this form. So I'm going to say um, f of x does not to equal to y or something else. Okay. So this part here, f of x does not equal to y, is a filter. It's basically saying if f of x does not equal to y, we don't care. Okay, because in that case, x and y are not related by the function itself. And I'm not going to say anything about this. Okay. Uh, shouldn't shouldn't it be if we're trying to define third action, the that f of x is y because we're trying to find some yeah action you're right such that to get f you're right of x okay active. I take it back. So we cannot use there exist anymore. Can you just say f of x equals y inside? Because yeah. That says that for every y, you have some x that maps to y. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I was trying to avoid you know, saying this. No, that should be it. I mean, that should do it, right? For all y in, for lowercase, for all y in the codomain, there exists an x in the domain such that x, y is an element of f. It maps to, you know, there's a reverse map for this y. There exists, there exists at least one. That can be multiple, but it, the multiple would also satisfy the requirement of there exist. Is that okay? Yes, we don't really need a filter. Yeah, we don't have a filter in this case because the actual statement of x, y in f is the statement that we want to say. There exists, you know, is already kind of saying, okay, there has to be at least one thing that meets the following requirements. So it's kind of doing that filtering already. 
Is that okay? All right. Do you guys want to do some examples? Like, you know, what is subjective, what is injective, and what is both injective and surjective? Okay, so I'm going to give you a few examples. You guys can tell me what it is. Okay. So, now the most important part of you know, this type of discussion is I do have to tell you what is the domain and the codomain ahead of time because there are always ways to fix it so that a function is surjective. Okay, so I'm going to say the uh, domain is 1, 2, um, and then the codomain is A, B, okay, but I also want to tell you exactly how things are mapped. So F is a set of two tuples where one maps to A and two maps to B, okay. So what do you know about this particular function? The domain has 1, 2. The codomain has A, B. The actual mapping is f of 1 is A, f of 2 is B. So is it is it surjective? It could be huh? It could be both. It is both. Very good. OK, but we will work on one at a time, OK? Is it injective from the previous discussion? In other words, everything from the domain maps to unique elements in the codomain, yes. Um, is it surjective, which means are all elements in the codomain utilized in the mapping? Yes. So if it's both, it is bijective. So this is a bijective function. Okay, so we'll just say this is bijective, which means it is injective and it is also surjective at the same time. Okay, now how can I make this injective? but not surjective anymore. What is the quickest and easiest way to make that happen? Exactly, just add C to the codomain and then it becomes injective but not surjective anymore. Okay, without changing the mapping because you know, now we have an element C in the, in the, in the codomain that is not utilized. That's good, okay. Any other questions? I mean, is this example Okay, sufficient to illustrate what makes a function surjective? Going once, going twice. Okay, but that's important because every time I give you a function that is not surjective, you can actually redefine the codomain to make it surjective. Okay, so I'll give you an example here. Okay, so we have a function here. The domain is one, two, three. And then the codomain is A, B, C, D. Okay. The actual function is mapping 1 to D. It maps 2 to A. And it maps 3 to A as well. Okay. So this example illustrates several things. One, this function is, is it injective? Well, first of all, is it even a function? Is everything in the domain mapped exactly once? Yeah. Yes, it is. So it is a function. Is it an injective function? It is not injective because 2 and 3, they both map to the same element in the codomain. It is not injective. Is it surjective? No. It is not surjective because we have more elements in the codomain than there are elements in the domain that automatically makes it non-surjective. Okay, but in this case, you can see that there are two elements in the in the codomain that are not mapped. In this case, we have uh, B not used and C is not used as well in the codomain. So how do you make something like this surjective? I don't really care so much about the injective part, but can we make it surjective? Exactly. Very good. So to make this function surjective, all you have to do is to remove items in the codomain that is not utilized. So you can quite easily make a function from non-surjective into a surjective function by you know, removing items in the codomain. Is that okay? Yes? So if you remove items from the codomain, 
in a way, but you're not changing the mapping. So you really are not changing that much of a function. But you are changing the nature of the function because you're no longer considering certain elements as a part of the code domain. So why would it have uh, elements in the code domain that it would be able to um, Because sometimes it's hard to express a code domain to make a function surject. I'll give you an example. Okay. Okay, so I'll give you an example here. So let's say you know we have an f that maps from um, all integers to all integers. So the funny looking z is uh, the set of all integers, okay? But I am defining f like this. I will say f of x is x squared. Okay, so first of all, you know, if I look at the domain as all integers and the codomain as all integers as well, but the function is really about squaring, is it a, is it surjective? No. It's not surjective for one really obvious reason, right? Because all the negative numbers should not be in the codomain. Well, that's an easy one. I can fix that real easy. So I can just, you know, say that, you know, Z is a set of natural numbers. Okay, and I'm not remembering how to do that. You know, a plus says it's all positive integers, and yeah. You could do backslash math bbn. Backslash? You could do math bbn. Oh, the, the natural numbers? Yeah, and generally mathematicians can't do this include zero, so. But there's a way to modify the z to mean it is including zero and all positive numbers. You just write the less than or equal to zero. Yeah, I think there's a superscript of Z that makes it mean, you know, all non-negative numbers. Okay. Okay, so let's, I'm just going to use, um, okay, now I have to...